today we are continuing with our study through the New Testament book of Romans. And we've already worked our way through the first four chapters. And the Apostle Paul, the author of Romans, has compellingly argued that not one of us is able to live the perfectly holy life that God wants us to live. Even though we may do our best to follow God's laws, none of us will ever be good enough to save ourselves. We will never be good enough to justify ourselves before God. But, as we've seen earlier in Romans, Paul tells us that the good news is that God has justified us himself through Jesus' death and resurrection. God has made us right with him through Jesus. So Paul teaches us that God invites us to put our faith or our full trust in Jesus as our Savior and that as we put our faith in him, we receive salvation from God as a gift. A gift. We're not saved by any good things that you and I do. We're saved by the grace of God extended to us through Jesus. That's what Paul's been driving home in the first four chapters of Romans. Then, in chapter 5, he continues. So please take your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 5. That's page 798 in the Bibles in the pews. Romans 5. <clears throat> Romans 5, beginning in the first verse, we read this. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. He says, next, we boast in the hope of the glory of God. We boast. In the hope of the glory of God. We boast. That is, we are joyfully confident in the hope that we have that because of Jesus, we will one day experience the full glory of God in eternal communion with Him. Though we are unworthy sinners, God, in His love, has graciously washed away our sin. We saw a beautiful picture of that in the baptisms. God has washed away our sin through the blood of Jesus. And God has offered salvation to us as a gift, welcomed us to know Him and enjoy Him forever. And this is available to anyone who chooses to receive it. This is fantastic news. Then Paul continues in verse 3. Paul says, Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. We'll come back to Romans 5 in a bit so you can leave your Bibles open to that. Paul wrote that we glory in our sufferings, or as most other translations of the Bible put it, we rejoice in our sufferings. What does that mean to glory in sufferings or rejoice in sufferings? Well, the first thing that that teaches us is that we should expect to suffer. Some people have the idea that if you become a Christian and if you're truly walking with God and obeying Him, then you won't be touched by pain or suffering. They believe that a true Christian's life should be an experience of receiving blessing after blessing after blessing from God. And therefore, suffering is not part of the game plan. In a sense, the Christian life is an experience of receiving blessing after blessing after blessing from God. But not in the sense or not in the way that some think. As the first note in the note sheets provided in the bulletin says, 
God doesn't bless us by keeping us free from all suffering. God blesses us by carrying us through whatever suffering we experience and by bringing good out of all the situations that we truly give over to him. God doesn't bless us by keeping us free from all suffering. He blesses us by carrying us through whatever suffering we experience and by bringing good out of all the situations we truly give over to him. Even situations that on the surface may look very, very bad. God can still bring good out of it. So, my brothers and sisters, suffering is on the way. Expect it. If you personally are not currently suffering, just be patient. Your turn will come soon enough. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning so you could hear this uplifting sermon? In one of Jesus' conversations with his disciples, he was talking to them about hard times, about suffering that they would soon experience. And then he said this. This is, comes from John 16. Jesus said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Amen? Now, as I said before, those of us who have put our faith in Jesus have been made right with God through Jesus. But even though we've been made right with God, that does not mean that we have been made right with the world. As I preached in a recent sermon, we are living in a fallen world filled with fallen people. Both humanity and the rest of creation have been warped and broken by sin. This means that, as the note sheet says, the more we come in line with God, the more out of line we will be with the world. The more we come in line with God, with who He is, with what He wants, the more out of line we will be with the world. And that explains why Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. In a world where people have the freedom to walk away from God, if they choose, and in a world where nature itself no longer functions as God originally designed it, bad things are going to happen. We will occasionally suffer. However, God will bless us by carrying us through whatever suffering we experience and by bringing good out of all the situations that we truly give over to Him. No suffering, whatever we experience, can overcome or is stronger than or greater than the sovereignty of God and the goodness of God. God is bigger than whatever suffering we experience. Now later, in the book of Romans, Paul explains this, and this is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. Romans 8, 28. Paul says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. That's a good verse, isn't it? God works in all things. He causes all things to work together for good. Part of what this means is that, as the note sheet says, in the life of a Christian, Satan never truly wins. That's good to know, isn't it? Because sometimes on the surface, especially in the beginning of the situation, or maybe even the middle of it, it may look otherwise. But in the life of a Christian, Satan never truly wins. If we continue to love God and seek Him and do our best to obey Him, then no matter what Satan does, no matter how he attacks, it, attacks us, God will find a way to turn it around for our good and for His glory. No wonder Satan's in a bad mood. Because everything he does always blows up in his face, eventually. 
if we seek God, if we love him. It says those who love him, those who are called according to his purpose. God will work all things. All things for our good. Amen? We're talking about suffering this morning. And I talk about no matter how Satan attacks us, God can turn it around. But not all suffering is the result of a satanic attack. Some suffering, just to be honest about it, we bring on ourselves, don't we? Maybe through sinful choices. Or just through poor choices. Maybe it wasn't a sinful choice, it just wasn't a wise choice. Other suffering occurs not because of any particular sin we've committed, but just because you and I are fragile people living in a fallen sinful world. Sometimes things just happen. None of it catches God by surprise. And he is greater than all of it. But sometimes bad things happen in a sin-fallen world. Last summer, my daughter fell from the monkey bars and broke her arm on her fifth birthday. That's a terrible thing to happen at all, but on your birthday, on your fifth birthday... It wasn't because she sinned. In a fallen, broken world, sometimes bad things happen. But as we've seen in Scripture, God can still pull good out of bad things no matter why they happened. Now, how will God pull good out of my daughter breaking her arm? I don't know. Maybe... Having experienced that, she'll be a little more cautious in a future situation and her caution will prevent her from suffering something far worse. I don't know. That's one way it could work. I don't know how God's going to do it. But I do know that God's Word tells us that God causes all things, even broken arms on birthdays. God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now the next note in the note sheet tells us one of the ways that God brings good out of our suffering is by using our sufferings to shape our character. One of the ways he brings good out of it is by using that suffering to shape our character. As we read just a moment ago in Romans 5, Paul said, We also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. And character, hope. The Bible tells us that suffering produces perseverance. Many years ago, when I was in my early 20s, I had a significant intestinal problem. I won't go into all the details because we're getting close to lunch and I want you to be able to eat. While I was having that painful recurring problem, at one point during one episode, the pain became excruciating. I honestly thought that I was going to die. And as the pain continued and became more intense, I wanted to die. I'm not exaggerating. I sincerely was like, God, take me home now. It was so painful that death would have been a welcomed relief. Now, in case you're wondering, I didn't die. I could see you were nervous. You're wondering, how's this end? I was taken to the emergency room and it all came out all right in the end. Maybe that wasn't the best choice of words. That was the most physical pain that I have yet experienced. In the years since, I've had other experiences of terrible physical pain. My back has gone out several times. I had a neck injury years ago that was so painful I couldn't move. It was terrible. I was immobilized. But I have thus far not experienced 
anything that's been as physically painful as that intestinal problem. And strangely enough, my having experienced that has made it easier for me to handle pain in the years since. Do you know what I'm talking about? Whenever I'm in physical pain for whatever reason, I always think, well, is it as bad as that was? And thus far, the answer has been, no. So I think, well, if I could get through that, I know I can get through this. Suffering produces perseverance. Now, maybe I will experience a greater physical pain at some point in the future. I don't know. I've not yet broken a femur. I've not yet had my eyeball get caught with a fish hook. I think it's highly unlikely I will ever give birth. But the physical suffering I experienced in the past has made it easier to deal with physical suffering in the years since. Suffering produces perseverance. Now, I've been talking about physical suffering. But emotional suffering, as many of you know, can be just as bad or even much worse. I have thus far experienced three situations in my life that produced what I consider to be extreme emotional suffering. I'm not going to tell you about all of them. But the most painful situation was when the woman who is now my ex-wife left me. We wound up being separated for over two years before it finally ended in divorce. That whole experience was painful. But the first seven months of that separation were agonizing. It was like being in a nightmare that would not end. Time passed so slowly. It was like I was aware of the passing of every second, of every minute. Have you ever been in a situation like that? The days were so long. The nights we're an eternity. And I can remember that during that time, on four different occasions, I got down on my knees alone at my house and begged God to kill me. And I wasn't joking. Death would have been a very welcomed relief. But God brought me through it. God brought me through it. And now, whenever I suffer for whatever reason, I look back and I think, man, if God can get me through that, I know he can get me through this. And so I don't give up. I keep on walking in faith. I persevere. Suffering produces perseverance. The Apostle Paul went on to say that perseverance produces character. And he's not just talking about any type of character. He's talking about integrity. He's talking about godly character. How does that work? The more we walk through situations in which we have to persevere through suffering, we persevere by depending on God, by trusting in Him. The more we go through stuff like that, then the more we grow in godly character. Why? How, do, how does that work? As we're in that situation, if we are walking in faith, we're depending on God, we're trusting in Him, our faith in Him grows deeper and deeper, it grows stronger and stronger because we are ex exercising those faith muscles. And just like any other muscle, I mean, the more you work it, the more you exercise, the stronger you get, and it's the same way with faith. The more God in His love allows me to be in situations where I have to depend on him, even though normally I don't want to go in those situations. The more he allows me to be in those situations, and if I respond to him in faith, just like a bodybuilder working out, it builds those muscles. 
That works spiritually. Obviously, it's not been working for me physically. That's why I'm wearing a coat. But spiritually, that's how it works. As the note sheet puts it, the more godly character we develop, the more we trust in the character of God. The more godly character we develop, the more we trust in the character of God, the more we trust in God's goodness, regardless of what situation we face. As we go through suffering, and as we persevere in faith in the midst of that suffering, then what happens, guys, is we begin to see a track record of God's faithfulness. He carries us. He sustains us. We see how he pulls good, even out of the bad. And as our faith perseveres, our character is shaped in such a way that we become people of hope. We see God's track record of faithfulness. I, I mentioned that example of me going through that separation and divorce, and not only did God get me through it, but what he did is he took what Satan meant for evil and he turned it around and he's blessed me through it. God has pulled good out of bad. He sanded off some rough edges in my life that, quite frankly, I'm embarrassed to admit, I don't know how else God could have sanded off those rough edges in my life. And I'm embarrassed that it would take something that drastic to make me a more gracious person, a more grace-filled person, a person who is more able to empathize with people who are really suffering. But God forgive me, that's what it took in my life. But God used it. And frankly, I know this sounds crazy, he's made me a better pastor because of it. Because now when I'm talking with somebody who's hurting and they feel like their world is falling apart, hey, I get it. I know, I've been there. And my heart goes out to them in a way that my heart didn't go out to people before. God's blessed me through it. He got me through it. He's, he's shaped my character. He's sanded off some rough edges. And then God blessed. Blessed me with this amazing, incredible woman who I don't deserve. I'm married up. God bless that. You know, yeah. How many of us married up? You better raise that hand. Yeah. You want to experience some suffering, don't raise that hand. Yeah. God's blessed me with some amazing kids. I mean, God didn't just get me through it. I saw the faithfulness of God. And as we see that track record, as our faith perseveres, and we see the track record of God's faithfulness, our character is shaped in such a way that you and I become people of hope. Paul wrote, suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. And character produces hope. When we suffer, if we will persevere in faith, then as we experience God's faithfulness, godly character is developed in us and we become the kind of people who hold on to hope no matter what comes our way. We've seen God work before. We may be truly suffering right now, but we can look back and we can say, hey, if God carried me through that and that and that and that, then I know he can carry me through this. And so we have hope. Even in the midst of difficult, th difficult times, of painful times, of heartache. Finish it up, today's passage. I told you we'd come back to Romans 5. Let's go back and finish it up there in verse 5. Paul wrote, And hope does not put us to shame. Or the translation puts it, Hope does not disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured, in, poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. God's love has been poured poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So hope does not put us to shame. In other words, we will not be disappointed or let down or embarrassed by our hope in God because we have experienced God's love for us in this situation, in that situation, in that situation. We've experienced the love of God. We don't just know about him, we know him.
He isn't just near us. He lives in us. Because through faith, each of us, through faith, through faith in Jesus, each of us has become a temple of the Spirit of Almighty God. He lives in us. We know Him. I put it this way on the note sheet. I have hope in God, not just because of what I've read or heard about Him. I have hope in God because I know Him personally. He and I have been through a lot. And while I have blown it and let Him down more times than I can remember, God has never let me down. God has always been faithful. He's never abandoned me. There have been many times when, quite frankly, I couldn't, I was totally callous to the presence of God. I couldn't sense the presence of God. I couldn't feel Him there. But as I got through that situation and got some distance and was able to look back, I could see God's fingerprints all over the whole thing. <laughs> He's never abandoned me. Jesus says that He will be with us even to the end of the age. We're promised by God in Hebrews 13. He says, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. God's faithfulness. I, I have hope. I have hope. Not just because of what I've read or what I've heard about God, but because I know Him. I know Him personally. So no matter what comes our way, as Paul said, we glory in our sufferings. We can rejoice in our sufferings because every occasion of suffering is an opportunity to grow closer to God and to learn more about His faithfulness. And through that experience to become a stronger person, not stronger in our own strength, but stronger in His. Now, before we wrap this up, there is one qualifying statement that I need to make. If you look around at all the suffering in the world, you will notice that not all suffering leads to perseverance. Not all suffering produces greater character. Not all suffering results in hope. Some suffering breaks and destroys people. I've seen that happen. I'm sure you have too. When some people suffer, as the old saying goes, they don't become better. They become bitter. Filled with more and more resentment and anger. Woundedness. Distrust of people and even of God. As the note sheet says, suffering doesn't always draw people closer to God. Just the truth of it. Well, then is, is what Paul said true? Paul said, we believe under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Paul wrote, suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Well, is that true or not? Well, when Paul wrote that, we need to recognize the context of that teaching. Just before he wrote about suffering leading to hope, Paul wrote this. We read it earlier. Let's read it again. Romans 5, the first verse. Paul wrote this. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Paul's teaching about suffering leading to hope is for those who have put their faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord. It's for those who are seeking to submit to Him and surrender our lives to our Creator, the one who made us, the one who loves us, even though He knows everything about us, the one who has created us for purposes and plans of His own making not for our own purposes and plans. The more we lay down our life to Him, just say, Lord, have your way. 
that, in that context, suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. Character produces hope. That's the context of the verse. That's why for some people, suffering, it doesn't lead to this greater blessing. Suffering just breaks them. Listen. In a sinful, fallen world, everyone suffers in some way or another. We all do. Suffering is inevitable here. And not just for us. Suffering was inevitable even for the sinless Son of God. Jesus, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, loved us enough to come to this earth. And he didn't just show up and hold a series of revival meetings and preach about God's goodness and then just get out of here. He chose to come as a baby, a vulnerable baby, dependent on humans to diaper his backside, went through all the awkwardness and difficulties of just growing up. Lived a humble life where he worked with his hands as a laborer. And then when the right time came, he, he set out. He set out preaching. And he talked about what it means for us to love God, what it means for us to love each other. And he just spoke the truth, and it ticked a lot of people off. And just when you would think that the sinless Son of God would just get rescued, whisked out of here before anything bad happens, that's not the way the story goes. Jesus willingly stayed in the midst of the situation, even to the point to where he allowed people to accuse him, try him, convict him, and execute him, and do so in a fashion, beating him within an inch of his life, his body a bloody mass of quivering flesh, allowed himself to be nailed to a cross and crucified. And then took the sins of all humanity on himself, paying for it, and died. The next time you and I, and hey, I understand, I've been there. The next time you and I are tempted in our suffering to say, God, why don't you care? God, why don't you do something? I think we need to remember the cross. And remember that however we're to make sense of suffering in this world, it's not always easy. However we're to make sense of it, we need to remember that we worship a God who knows what it's like. He's been there too. He doesn't love us from a distance. He stepped into our flesh, blood, and bone, and he let it happen. Just like it happens to me and you, and he went through it too. God knows what it's like to suffer. The Bible says at one point Jesus on the cross looked skyward and said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We worship a God who knows what it's like. And yet he looks at the whole mess of all this experience and still believes that for some reason, maybe not entirely understandable to us, for some reason, it's all worth it. The Bible says in Hebrews 12 that Jesus, for the joy of put before him, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. See, what we suffer, what we deal with now, guys, this earthly life is just the prelude. It's the prelude to something far greater. And God is working toward that. He's working to prepare in you and me the type of character that can actually handle being a citizen of heaven. He is preparing us to be the kind of people who can drink in the presence of God to such an extent that heaven is beyond our wildest imaginations. The joy, the experience of communing, to, communing with God in that level, in that way. I want to read to you briefly something that you're not prepared to put up there, buddy. I didn't give you this reference, but I wanted you to, wanted you to hear this. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16. Listen to what Paul said. He said, Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our, listen to this, and this was written by a man who had been beaten almost to death multiple times, who had been shipwrecked, who had been de deprived, gone without food, gone without water, who had been through all sorts of junk, because he tells us in the same book. That same guy wrote this. For our light 
and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. For our light momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Not only does God use suffering for our good even in this world, God is preparing for us an eternal destiny that I can't even begin to describe. Suffering is inevitable here. So the question is not whether or not we will suffer. The question is, when we suffer, will you and I face that situation alone? Alone in our strength? Alone just depending on our own wisdom? Or will we face it with God, able to draw from His strength, able to draw from His wisdom and His guidance? Will you choose to trust in Jesus as your Savior? Submit your life to Him as your Lord? Will you choose to trust in the goodness of God no matter what comes your way? It's not always easy to do. Sometimes we've got to choose to trust God because we don't always feel like it. Especially if we're suffering. Will we choose to trust in the goodness of God no matter what? Will you and I continue to set our own agendas and plans aside and instead surrender to God's call and the purpose for the life he's given us to surrender to his purposes for us. He said, why does it matter to surrender to his purposes? Remember, remember Romans 8, 28, we read this earlier. It says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. I will not reap the benefit of a sovereign God working all things for my good if I live my life insisting on my own way, my own plan, following my heart following my dream. But if I lay down my life and say, God, I believe I wasn't just created for me. I'm created for a far greater purpose. I'm created for you. And I lay down my life and say, God, you have your way. Then what God does is he takes everything in my life, even, even my sin, even my failures, and he starts retroactively working it all so that it all turns out for my good and his glory. But that ain't going to happen unless I lay it down. I love God, at least I try to. And I live according to His purpose. God has given us freedom. But as the note sheet says, if we choose, if we use that freedom, if we choose to give our lives over to Him, God can then work in our lives and even pull good out of the bad. But if we choose to not give our lives over to God, then God will respect our choice. He's not a tyrant. He'll respect our choice and he'll pull back. And you and I will face the trials and struggles of this life with only human resources to fall back on. I've occasionally heard people say, all this stuff about faith in Jesus, that's just a crutch for people, or too, for people who are too weak to face life standing on their own two feet. Jesus is just a crutch. Well, hey, guess what? Call me weak. Because I know I am not strong enough to face the suffering in this world apart from God. And I'm not ashamed to admit it. I've talked with person after person at funerals. People of faith who have looked at me and they've said this, and I'll bet you've heard this at some point too. They said, I don't know how people who don't know Jesus make it through things like this. You ever heard people say that? I'm not strong enough to make it through life apart from God. I'm not. Are you willing to admit that too? Will we choose to walk with God or not? Suffering is going to happen one way or the other. But man, I'd much rather face it with God than just on my own. What's God saying to you this morning?
I know we could go down the pews and hear story after story of big time suffering. And I know the stuff I've been through doesn't even compare to what some of you have been through because some of you have told me your stories. And yet we could also go down the pews and hear story after story after the faithfulness of God. What's God saying to you this morning? You may be in the teeth of the pain right now, in the midst of some terrible situation. God can and will use that for your good and his glory if you'll give it over to him. If you'll give yourself over to him. Would you stand? I'm going to ask musicians to take their places. Would you please pray with me? Let's pray.